Churchill in a T-shirt. This is a compliment. Zelensky is like Churchill, yet he's wearing a T-shirt and he's all over the place and he's leading and everybody's impressed, right? And uh, well, you know what? I'm one of those people who's impressed to a point. Now, there's a lot we don't know about Zelensky. Like a lot of politicians, he ran on an anti-corruption platform. That's how you get attention in Ukraine. And guess what? They started accusing him of corruption. Unclear to me whether that has merit or not, but I'm not going to fall in love with this guy. Number one, the POWs over there are not being treated well. Russian prisoner after Russian prisoner is being paraded in front of cameras. Folks, this is against the law, international law and the Geneva Conventions. You're not allowed to do this kind of stuff. Still, Zelensky does seem pretty great. I mean, he's over there and people are excited. The last time people were excited like this, we had a governor named Cuomo. Remember him? He was everywhere all the time in the middle of COVID. Everybody was so impressed. Look at him. He looks great. He sounds great. He's providing leadership until they decided he's the worst person in the world, right? It happened like that. But boy, oh boy, it was fun while it lasted, for him at least. It's the way that Andrew came in and just felt like a hero to us all. So Andrew Cuomo, I think, is almost the president of New York in this circumstance. Move over, LGBTs, there's a new identity in town. Cuomo sexual, a new term for Empire State Governor Andrew Cuomo, America's favorite fella. All right. For the record, I never called him that. I never, I never succumbed to any of that. And here we go again with Zelensky. Maybe. I don't know. I am suspicious of overnight heroes. Cuomo, Zelensky, and even Putin. Do you remember for a while they were pushing Putin like crazy? Oh, my gosh. He's a genius. Oh, look at him. He's so strong, big, like ox. And the headlines were all over the place. <laughs> the, the establishment fell in love with this guy for a long time. Anyway, I am not going to go along with these narratives, uh, or at least I'm going to understand that it's a narrative, and there's a damn good chance it may not be true. Now, looking at the battlefield in Ukraine, it does not look good for the Russians right now. They expect this to turn, but... What is up with these folks? Uh, they're, they're not very good at fighting a war, are they? Uh, everyone says that they were expecting to just whip right in and take control, but I had a feeling there were cracks in the armor of the Russians going back, well, going back to 2014. Now first, consider this. Alcoholism is a big deal in Russia, and it's a big deal in the Russian army. We have reports of soldiers not on duty, but drunk, while they're in Ukraine. One in five Russian men die in alcohol-related uh, causes and mishaps. That's a big number. And in 2014, the Russian military, when they were annexing Crimea, shot down a Malaysian airliner by accident that was just flying in the area. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine may have claimed the lives of more than 300 innocent air travelers. A Malaysian Airlines jet flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur appears to have been shot down over eastern Ukraine, coming down near the village of Grabovo, near Donetsk. Ukraine said that its armed forces were not involved, fueling suspicions that Russian separatists may have been responsible. Always blaming the other guy. That happened and it may have been alcohol related. Hey, I'm gonna say this for Joe Biden, at least he doesn't drink, at least he doesn't drink. You know, he took the weekend off again. Isn't that incredible? I mean, everything that's going on in the world, this is a job he wanted his entire life, first run for the presidency all the way back in 1987, and he can't be away from the White House enough. He left on Friday, came back late last night, off the helicopter, all the trappings of, Presidential power, the house where he stayed, is it really as nice as the White House? What is it about this place? Why is he going there? And you know what? I think it's in violation of the promise that all politicians make, actually, but Joe in particular. I will make this promise today. Those families hurting across the country. I will never, 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 never give up this fight. Never give up this fight. The kind of thing that's so easy to say when you're campaigning. Never give up this fight, but I will take weekends off. What else? 
I never discussed international business dealings with my son, Hunter, even when he got that big lucrative job from Ukraine. No, ask about Trump. I did not talk to him about that. Sure, sure. Wild that Joe Biden wanted, wanted Ukraine in his portfolio, one of the most notoriously corrupt countries on earth. That's where Joe wanted to hang out. Very interesting. And oh, by the way, he, it's a given, it's understood. He talked about Burisma with his son. Take a look at this email, which has not been debunked. It's the real deal. Dear Hunter, thank you for inviting me to DC and giving an opportunity to meet your father and spent some time together. English is a second language. This is from uh, Vadim Patsakorizi. And yes, at the time he was a key advisor to the board at Burisma. So Joe is not good at this stuff. He's not gonna get any better and neither is his staff, unfortunately. Uh, this is Secretary Blinken. Uh, he's, uh, he blinks a lot. You're not supposed to blink. Even his name is Blinken. All right, maybe I'm nitpicking, but uh, well, you tell me, is this, uh, is this projecting American strength? Take a look. We've seen very uh, credible reports about the, uh, the use of certain weapons. Uh, and what we're doing right now is documenting all of this, uh, putting it all together, uh, looking at it. All of us together are continuing to take steps to increase the pressure uh, on Russia through uh, additional sanctions, all of which are very actively under discussion. If he's un unwilling to stop the aggression, uh, we're, we're going to do them. So we will look at each and every one, decide together with yeah. uh, our allies and partners what's most effective, uh, when we should do it, and uh, we'll, proceed, uh, we'll proceed in that way. Okay, we're taking steps. We are going to take steps. We're discussing. Not only are we discussing, we are actively discussing. We're going to do it. We're documenting things. All of this is weakness. And I think, quite frankly, there's a bit of a, a guilt complex going on here because Blinken and his boss, Biden, they've been together for a long time. Back in 2009, Joe Biden was pushing Ukraine membership in NATO. Guess what? That was considered very, very provocative. It's one of the reasons we're in the hole we're in right now, all right? One of the reasons why Putin is doing what he's doing. And take a look at uh, Mr. Blinken. This is something else. On that trip in 2009, in a briefing after the talks here, Anthony J. Blinken, Mr. Biden's national security advisor, said he hoped that Russia would view American policy as an effort to build a multi-partner world and to shore up the stability of the entire region. We're not trying to build our own sphere of influence, he said. The partnerships aren't being built against anyone. They're being built for the purpose of addressing common challenges that Russia also faces. But in classic Swamp style, he offers this as his get out of jail free card. I don't have any guarantee that's how it's going to play out. Interesting, right? And total Swamp. You know, something that the Biden administration has going against them and actually America in this situation has going against us, none of these guys, Biden, his secretary of state, his national security advisor, has any military experience, none, zero. Um, I have a little bit. Actually, I have some in flying in no-fly zones over southern Iraq in 1998. We were enforcing the no-fly zone, and whenever I hear these people talk about, well, just established a no-fly zone, it's very they're very simplistic in their approach, and they don't really understand what it entails. And enter Marco Rubio, Senator Rubio. He's very good when it comes to foreign affairs. He seems to know the ins and outs of no-fly zones. He's somebody to listen to. Are you and your colleagues now more open to a no-fly zone? You know, the, the, look, a no-fly zone has become a catchphrase. I'm not sure a lot of people fully understand what that means. That means flying AWACS 24 hours a day. That means the willingness to shoot down and engage Russian airplanes in the sky. That means, frankly, you can't put those planes up there unless you're willing to knock out the anti-aircraft uh, systems that the Russians have deployed, and not just in Ukraine, but in Russia and also in, in, in Belarus. So basically, a no-fly zone, it, uh, if people understood what it means, it means World War III. He's right. He's right. Could be president someday. It's going to be a long time, though. It's going to be a long time. Keep your eye on Marco Rubio. 
And also, we remember that this would not be happening if Trump were still in power. It is obvious, and by the way, he was telling Europe, warning them, get off of that Russian oil and gas. He was saying it in early stages of his presidency, and they literally, literally laughed at him. Reliance on a single foreign supplier can leave a nation vulnerable to extortion and intimidation. That is why we congratulate European states such as Poland for leading the construction of a Baltic pipeline so that nations are not dependent on Russia to meet their energy needs. Germany will become totally dependent on Russian energy if it does not immediately change course. Here in the Western Hemisphere, we are committed to maintaining our independence from the encroachment of expansionist foreign powers. They laughed at him. That's the German delegation laughing at him. They should have listened to him. Angela Merkel and all of those leaders, they didn't like him, the diplomats. They couldn't stand him, but he was right. And American diplomats, oh, by the way, they just found his manner offensive. They were always pulling stunts you know, objecting, petitions, uh, we object, walkouts, that kind of thing. They were sabotaging from within. I wonder how they feel right now, because instead of leading on this situation, we are following, you know, in the old days, well, what are we doing now? We're seizing yachts. Wow, that's really gonna bring this to a close, right? We, we seized the yacht. There was a time in this country where we seized the hill and nobody messed with us, huh? I think those days are coming back, I'm not sure when though.